culture has been defined as man's extra-somatic means of adaptation. That means basically it's the thoughts, the ideas, the tools, the techniques that people use to live. The specific Choctaw brand of culture has its roots in the Choctaw homeland over the last 13,000 years or so. Culture is something that's adaptive, it changes, it grows and develops through time just like anything that's alive. And so Choctaw culture has done this through the centuries. It's been developed and it's been passed down from generation to generation. Some of the elder people have taken great pains to hold on to Choctaw traditional culture and Choctaw traditional knowledge despite the obstacles that are out there. And today to have young people who are interested in learning about these things, there comes an energy in that, an excitement in being able to pass that on to the younger people. And that's something that's very old, the way that it's been passed through centuries is still happening today.
to some of the Choctaw oral traditions, the bow and arrow is a, a gift that was given to us by God himself. Before Choctaws used the bow, um, we used something called the atlatl. It's a kind of spear thrower. Those were in use up until about 780 or so in the Choctaw homeland. After that, almost everybody started to use the bow and arrow.
The preservation of traditional art, traditional knowledge, it's what makes Choctaw people unique. It's ultimately what gives us our identity. If Choctaw people were to lose that, if we were to lose our language, if we were to lose our traditional arts, our songs, our dances, we would have essentially melted into the American culture. It would be just like everybody else. There would be nothing to make us unique. And in a certain sense, the Choctaw people would have died out. So by holding on to these things, we're maintaining our identity, we're helping Choctaw people as a group, as a specific ethnicity to survive. According to this story, there was a Choctaw hunter who went out looking for deer, and late in the evening he found a doe and he shot it with his bow and arrow. In the night, this doe came back to life, and he woke up and he was really surprised to see this doe standing there alive. And then she spoke to him, and that surprised him even more. She told him to follow her. So he got up and he followed her to this cave in the ground, and he went down underneath there. And there were all the deer inside this cave. The king of the deer, the leader of the deer, told the other animals to take hooves and hide and antlers and put them on him. So they did that. He kind of struggled, but they got it on him. And then he himself looked like a deer. And he came out the next day and he was running around with the herd of deer. The hunter's family, after several days of him not coming back, became concerned and went out to look for him. And they went out and they found his camp with this bow sitting there and they knew that something must have happened. And at this time, a herd of deer ran up and one of them wasn't afraid. It came right up to them. And the hunter's mother looked into the eyes of this animal and saw the eyes of her son. And so she kind of freaked out and she insisted that this was her son. And the people grabbed it and she said that they needed to take the, the hooves and the antlers and the hide off of it, which they did. But this killed her son. And so they went home and they mourned him. And so to me, the, this story really plays up the relationship of the connection between Choctaws and deer. Nanichaha Nanichaha apaknama tanti hu lokchit hayakat anshatto Ohoyo hosh tanti hapimatto mea country in 1541 and they were led by Hernando de Soto and he had four chroniclers that kept accounts of the different battles that were fought. There was a Spanish man who was charging a native man and the Spaniard was on horseback and he was going to ride the native guy down and try to kill him. But the native guy shot an arrow at the horse and he hit the horse in the front and it almost came out the back end of the horse. I mean it almost went through about four feet of horse flesh which is amazing. See you everybody. Sio, Halito, Chimichakma. <laughs> so I'm Cherokee and Choctaw. My mom was Cherokee and my grandpa was Choctaw. And um, we're from Harlan County, Kentucky. Um, and a lot of our family are still in Oklahoma. 
um, our extended families there. We're also on my dad's side, who's African American and Lumbee. Um, there's 300 of us in North Carolina. So if you knock on the door, it's probably my, one of my cousins. So <laughs> I'll tell you a little story about um, how we came to the, the project that we've been traveling with. Um, I used to do, sing a lot of rhythm and blues and soul music. And then um, the elders back home, family members and people of our community started passing, passing on. And so um, when you start losing these amazing people in your family who can help you keep your culture, help you keep your language, share our stories, and you see that leaving, I wanted to kind of honor them, you know, and honor this rich land that we came from. Anyway, I'm going to start out. This is just little old me today. And... Um, I'm going to do like a mixture of some songs and also sing some, do some call and response. So we're going to try to make this um, like a little congregation because up in Appalachia where I'm from, we do a lot of, you know, call and response and congregational singing. So would you guys like to learn a little bit of Salagi? Well, you really, if I, if I holler, will you holler back? All right. Oh, y'all are ready today. All right, well, this first one, I'm going to honor the women. This is a women's honoring song, so you guys just sit tight and, uh, for a minute, and, um, and I'll do a prayer. It's called Anagea. It's honoring women. Anagea, we are you? We are we are we are we we are we are we are we are we are we we are we are we are we we are we 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 are we are we are we we are we are we are we are we are we we are we are we are we are we are we are we
does it mean to me? Oh, it's very important. It's a part of my tradition. You know, it's about passing something on, something that belonged to your ancestors years and years before. The River Cane Flute. The very word Oklahoma is Choctaw. And here in this land where our ancestors settled, water has always been a treasured resource. Sustained by healthy water, River Cane is the lifeblood of the art. Water plays a big role in making the traditional flute. You've got to have plenty of water for the switch cane to grow, and if you don't have enough water, they'll pretty much die. And then once they die, then you've got a tradition that's gone. As in every Choctaw art form, each meticulous step in the flute-making process is a challenge. The result? An earth-forged instrument capable of making beautiful music.
I learned this from my mother. The art of basketry is alive and well, and like pottery, it's connected to our land and water. What makes our baskets authentic is the cane that grows by our streams. Replenishing river cane along our waterways will help preserve our heritage and restore wildlife habitats. I come here to collect the same materials weavers in my family have used for five generations. The river cane strands are meticulously woven into a finished basket. Interest in Choctaw basketry is growing as more and more Choctaws learn this inspiring art form. It's very dear to me because it comes from my family, my grandmother and my mother and so forth. So since it's part of a Choctaw history and tradition, I would hope that they would want to preserve it so that it can continue for many more generations. The cultural awakening of the Choctaw Nation is nurturing a new generation of young basketry artists. And now I'm so proud both of my boys are carrying on our tradition.
We'll take broken sections of pottery that have been fired, lay them on the hot ground. We'll take the pottery we want to fire, lay it on top of those broken pieces of pottery. And then we'll start to build the fire around the pots. We build the fire bigger and we slowly scoot it closer. That heats them up slowly and evenly. Eventually the pots will get hot enough that they'll start to glow a red color, just like glowing red metal. That lets us know that they're up over a thousand degrees and that they're functionally fired at that point. After that, we just let the fire die down, let it burn out all night, and then we come back the next day and take the pots out. The pottery that we make through our classes and that our students make is fully functional. Um, the eating bowls, you can eat out of them just like a store-bought container. The cooking pots are kind of like cast iron. You season them with oil and then you just set them right on the coals of a fire like you would a Dutch oven. The Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma is working to revitalize Choctaw traditional pottery. So far we've taught 180 class sessions and we've taught them about 18 locations and we've had more than 500 students. The, the response has been pretty phenomenal.